one more minute for people to connect. And then we can start. One more minute for people to connect. And thank you to all of those who are already here with us. And now I think we can begin. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you and welcome. Welcome uh, to uh, this very timely discussion. Um, I would like to really extend a very warm, uh, warm welcome to all of you for and thank you for joining us on behalf of uh, the Association of the European Cancer Leagues, um, ECL, the European Fair Pricing Network, my organization, the European Public Health Alliance, with the support of the INTES Group, MEPs Against Cancer of the European Parliament. It is a great pleasure um, to be with you um, today. There was a great interest in this event because especially now, almost two years into the pandemic, we saw what the benefits and what the added value of um, uh, European collaboration, but also regional cross-border initiatives of collaboration can play also when it comes to medicines procurement. And the, the, the question that we um, ask, we're asking today is whether we can get to the point of having fair prices uh, for medicines through these initiatives, through these uh, joint procurement initiatives, through these initiatives that can be either, as we saw, uh, Brussels driven in the case of the uh, vaccines procurement against COVID-19, but also the more, let's say, uh, the names that have become kind of household names like the Beneluxa Initiative of Collaboration, uh, the Valletta Group of Countries, Initiatives which were not there uh, um, seven years ago. I would say I remember the first uh, um, from uh, Beneluxa was already in, uh, um, I would say, 2015. So not such a long time ago. So before we proceed, these are some, let's say, housekeeping rules. Um, if I can have the, the slide, please. You can obviously... My apologies, these things can happen. I don't know why it hasn't happened so far. Um, this is a view only event. Uh, it is obviously recorded and it will be available later on on demand on YouTube. Use the hashtag that I mentioned before, Let's Talk Access, and to follow and to take part in the conversation, obviously, on uh, Twitter. For your questions, please use the Q&A uh, function and I will try to bring the questions into our conversation. Um, and use the chat in uh, the chat room only in case you have any uh, technical um, questions. We are delighted to be able to start our um, event with a special address. Uh, we were supposed to have with us the Minister of Health of Slovenia, but we have a, a pre recorded uh, video message from the State Secretary of Health and from Slovenia, the country that has 
the current rotating presidency of the European Union, Mr. Robert uh, Schugel. Let's please uh, listen to what the State Secretary of Health of Slovenia has to say, and we'll be right back. Honorable colleagues and members of the European Parliament, dear participants, good afternoon. Today, I stand before you with a message of solidarity and collaboration. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the vulnerability and highlighted the vital need to build a real health union. It is now opportunity to shape an European Union health union that delivers to patients. This also includes access to safe, effective, and highly quality medicines at the at afforded place to all patients across the EU. High prices of new medicines are justifiable and acceptable. EU action can help member states pave the way towards fair prices so that all citizens can access the medicines they need. There is no silver bullet to solve issues related to accessibility, affordability, and availability of medicines for cancer patients. But there is sound rational for increased collaboration between countries in the procurement of health technologies. Joint procurement can be used useful mechanism to reduce the price of medicine. By joining forces, also relatively small countries, and not particularly attractive from a business point of view, like Slovenia is, can see new health technology coming to the market. Innovative medicines and medical devices have an added value compared to existing solution only if they reach a benefit to patient. With the launch of the pharma pharmaceutical strategy for Europe and Euro's beating cancer plan, EU institutions are playing a critical role in shaping the next generation of medicines. The experience of negotiation of EU wide price for COVID-19 vaccines has already shown that the EU can be successful when working together, not without challenges, but the, the results are very clear. All cancer EU patients should benefit from the best possible treatment that science can provide. No one should be left behind only because they live a certain geographical area. We need to take into account the excellent work already being done and built on the progress already achieved. At the same time, we need to go further and be more ambitious. Here today, we have enormous capacity for re energizing existing initiative and starting new ones building of the lessons learned from the EU vaccines procurement strategy. My message today is very clear and simple. It will be only through solidarity, cooperation and coordination that we will achieve a true European health union and bring the right medicine at the right time to the right person. I wish all participants and speaker a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. We already, we already heard some key messages from the State Secretary of um, Health uh, from Slovenia, the country that has um, the presidency right now, but also a country that has uh, played an important role um, in the uh, Valletta group of countries, uh, the, that regional intergovernmental initiative of collaboration. Um, we will now hear from Dr. Ward Rommel. Uh, Dr. Ward Rommel is with the European Cancer League, but also with the Flemish uh, Cancer League, with a long standing pressure and presence on the uh, access to medicines debate in Europe. And we are here today for a very important, an additional very important reason, which is the launch of the ECL paper, and we see it here, right next to the picture of uh, Ward. I encourage you to uh, read it carefully. Um, it includes um, some, I would say, pretty spot on recommendations for different stakeholders. But Ward, first over to you, so that you can give us a bit of an intro introduction to this paper, which is launched today. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Yanis. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as, as the chair of the, the Access to Medicines Task Force, um, I want to welcome and thank the, the participants and, and the panelists for their presence and, and participation in the panel of today. So um, we are launching our paper about cross-border collaboration for better access to valuable drugs. Um, so I, we think in, in the field of cancer, it's, it's quite an exciting time because a lot of new treatments have come to the market in recent years. And we think that the, the pipeline looks promising for the coming years. But at the same, same time, there are some challenges to make these drugs accessible. So it has already been mentioned that the prices of new treatments can be very high. Um, sometimes when drugs come to the market their evidence about a real added value is rather limited and we also see a lot of um, unequal access across eu not every patient has the same access to new drugs um, and so we noticed that in recent years uh, countries have started to collaborate in the european union to tackle these challenges and in our paper we identify four levels of collaboration um, so the first step of collaboration is informed procurement um, and here countries are exchanging information about the drug market about drug prices about added value of drugs um, and on the next level we find coordinated informed procurement and this is a way of collaborating between countries um, where they are, are organizing projects together so projects to collect information about um, the pipeline about the drug market about prices um, a quite well-known example here is the international horizon scanning initiative one level higher countries can also work together to jointly negotiate about prices an example here is uh, spinraza so a drug for um, rare disease sma and uh, the, Net the netherlands and belgium negotiated together to make these drug uh, reimburse reimbursable um, then on the highest level, we find the joint procurement and uh, joint procurement. Here we have a central body that is negotiating and concluding agreements for drug uh, reimbursement on behalf of, um, of, of the members of the, of the, the member states of the collaboration. Uh, and of course, uh, a case in point here is um, the procurement of the COVID-19 vaccines by the European uh, Commission. So we have these four levels of collaboration and as a task force access to medicines, we believe that they are very important and that they should be reinforced and we see some clear challenges for the coming years. So we believe that the existing cross-country collaborations um, should be reinforced. So for example, the Beneluxa collaboration, uh, Valletta, also the, the Nordic collaboration like uh, Finos. So this collaboration should be reinforced and we should also involve more countries. Um, our paper contains some recipes to do that. I don't have the time here to, to, to go into these recipes, but um, if you want to know them, you should read the paper. So uh, I'm not telling it also because, to, because I want to make you curious and incite you to read the paper. Um, then the next challenge is that we, we think that we should think about increasing the number of successful joint pricing negotiations. So we have the example of Spinraza, but there should be um, more examples and we should think about how, how to increase the, the number of, of negotiations, joint negotiations. And then finally, so um, we have had the procurement, the joint procurement of COVID-19 vaccines. I think we should also start to, to explore how we can extend the joint EU procurement to other types of drugs, for example, expensive cancer drugs um, or expensive drugs for rare diseases. Um, we also want to stress that uh, for all these um, approaches and all these uh, um, initiatives, they, they should all live up to some um, clear quality uh, criteria. For example, we believe that every process of procurement should include um, um, a robust health technology assessment. Um, every process should also be as transparent as possible and um, the concluded agreement and the concluded prices should also be transparent. And finally, um, agreements about reimbursement um, should not curtail independent research um, by uh, uh, academic researchers of the reimbursed drugs. 
So this was uh, just a, sh a short overview of what is in our paper and what we see as the challenges. I hope we have some interesting reflections here for the, the first panel discussion. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Ward. And let's let's move on to the first panel today. We will have another one later on. Um, it's my pleasure. It's a privilege to be joined today by Clemens Martinauer. Clemens Sauer is is a well-known figure in uh, Brussels, but also in in Austria. He is the special envoy for health uh, for Austria, but also um, the vice chair of the WHO executive board, as well as the president of um, Europe's uh, leading uh, policy platform. I would say the European Health Forum, Gastein. Natasa Zoparti Muscat will be joining us uh, shortly. She's with um, Hans Kluge at the WHO regional office in Europe. And of course, um, and Natasha also brings a lot of experience um, uh, from academia, but also on the national level from uh, her home country, uh, Malta. And of course, Sylvain Giraud. Sylvain Giraud is um, uh, the head of unit at the European Commission with a long experience in uh, pharmaceutical policies um, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Um, if, if I can see, if we can remove the, the slide and I can start with my first question, I hope my internet connection will not um, fail me again. Um, if I can see uh, uh, Sylvain and uh, I think perhaps uh, Natasha hasn't joined us um, yet. No, but it's okay, she will be joining shortly. Well, I can start with a question to, um, to Sylvain. Uh, Sylvain, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my question is uh, now with uh, the in the pandemic and um, since the start of the of the mandate of the current commission, is affordability still a top priority for the commission or has the question of affordability uh, or is it overshadowed perhaps um, uh, by other uh, priorities such as boosting the supply chain resilience or boosting the, the, the competitiveness of, of the business sector? Uh, thank you, Yanis, and uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to the organizations that are putting this meeting together, and thank you for inviting me to join. Um, well, you ask, uh, is affordability still an important uh, aspect of our policy? I would say certainly more than ever, uh, and certainly more than it was a few years ago, and I guess uh, you will recognize that, because the way uh, this, just this word, which I can tell you, it was not even authorized to pronounce in the commission a few years ago, I have my own experience, uh, is now become a central word on the uh, mandate of the commissioner and a very central pillar uh, in the pharma strategy. Uh, the pharma strategy that we published last year, the end of last year, November 2020, um, has different objectives. And uh, we try to go with a sort of holistic approach. We believe that it is possible to achieve several objectives uh, by working together across the different authorities that are involved on um, you know, reinforcing availability, uh, ensuring affordability, uh, developing access, equality in access, uh, but also uh, making sure that uh, we have an industry that uh, is uh, developing its uh, uh, own project uh, to serve the, the objectives of public health um, in a way that uh, they find a regulatory environment that is conducive to investment and to uh, research and innovation. So uh, we believe that those different objectives can be pursued together. They have to be pursued together. This is uh, the objective of the policy tools that we should put together. And that involves affordability. On affordability, and, and I'll stop, um, we're talking about an area, and this may be why this word was not so used a few years ago. We're talking about an area that is primarily within the remit of the national competencies, as we say, at EU level. Um, however, however, we believe, and this is what we say in the strategy, that one, uh, the legislation and the legislative framework has relevance for the affordability challenges, and so we need to look at that. And we also say that even if it's a national competence, we can work together to support each other on national policy making. And there are a lot of instruments, a lot of, of, of lessons that can be learned and a lot of it, including procurement, but it's just one of them, where we can develop cooperation. And this is what we've started to do quite intensively with the national authorities in charge of pricing and reimbursement in a group uh, that is new and that has been really reboosted and that we believe is developing very concrete work. Thank you, Sylvain. That's, that's pretty clear. Clemens, uh, and thank you, Natasha. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining us. 
Clemens, do you think that um, Sylvain has allies in the council from the member states? What does your experience say? Are member states over the years, we have uh, many years of experience um, in this discussion, are member states concerned by the issue of, of high prices? I can't remember, Yanis, um, over the many last years, a single meeting, maybe a little bit prior to COVID, where the of ministers of health, where there was not a um, substantial complaint about costs and prices, especially for innovation. And, um, you know, and in the, in the meantime, it's clear that if you look at the pharmaceuticals, and that's also true for many of the cancer drugs, we do have two problems. We have the problem for the generics, you know, because we are losing uh, quite a bit of product there because they are too cheap. People like me, we were too successful in negotiating a good price. <laughs> so it's so the, the economic incentives are not done there anymore. And the other big problem, of course, is the high cost and the high price, you know, call it whatever, uh, for, innovative, for innovative drugs. See, and <clears throat> so there's, there's a lot of allies, you know, but, the, but I think we gained so much political momentum in terms of strategic and practical and actual doing through the COVID-19 vaccine uh, joint procurement. So that, that, that was a game changer, I think, also <clears throat> in, our, in our understanding, in our mind, because, you know, to be also very honest, you know, all these good initiatives like Beneluxa and Valletta and blah, 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 you know, there's a limited success. There was a limited success, but with this joint procurement of vaccines, that was a huge success. Yanis and the audience, please think about one thing. We had, we have achieved with this joint procurement thing that all European citizens, and I, rem I repeat myself, all European citizens had the same access to the same portfolio of COVID-19 vaccines at the same time to the same cost or price and, 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 and the same delivery schemes. You know, there was no difference between a high income country in the European Union and a middle income country, the North and the South, the East and the West. We all had the same vaccines in the same time, in the same quality. What can you prove more successful than this initiative? So it is high time that we transfer that success story, at least when it comes to innovative high-priced drugs. We have to repeat that because, you know, Yanis, and some of you, you know me, I'm saying since many, many years, the same thing. And Ward also mentioned it. There is no equal access within the European Union, the 25, when it comes to innovative drugs. I'm a happy guy because I'm a high income country. Austria always has innovation <clears throat> of the latest and most innovative drugs. But there is, so I'm in a club of maybe six, seven countries. The rest of the European Union member states don't have immediate access to innovation. And especially when it comes to innovative cancer drugs. So compare that with the success story of the vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines, so I think it's clear what we have to do. Excuse me that Thank I was a little bit longer, but this is, we have to gain the momentum now. No, hmm. absolutely. And I'll come back to you because I, looking ahead, what, what would your recommendations for action be oh. uh, based on the lessons and the early conclusions drawn from the ongoing procurement of vaccines uh, against COVID-19? Hold that thought. I'll come back to you on that. Natasha. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is an issue high on the agenda, the question of fair pricing, the question of how to tackle um, uh, high medicines prices, also very high on the agenda of WHO Europe. Um, to, and you have found an unlikely ally, the government of uh, Norway, and you've launched the uh, so-called Oslo Medicines Initiative. If you can a bit um, walk us a bit through it and tell us where we are today. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Yanis. And it's always a pleasure also to listen to Sylvain and Clemens. I think we are very much of the same mind on this topic. Perhaps before explaining about the Oslo Medicines Initiative, just allow me the opportunity to make one small observation. 
which is that within the EU, of course, there is differential access. But having come to work now the past two years in WHO Europe, I have been struck by the big gaps and huge disparities as soon as we even then emerge outside the EU borders. And in this sense, yes, of course, um, we are very grateful to the Norwegian government for having put this item high on the agenda, which is, of course, on the agenda also for us through the European program of work. Why? Because we talk about united action for better health. And I think it's very clear, as the COVID pandemic has shown, that unless we really unite our, our forces together, um, we can't ensure that everybody's health moves forward. I like the, the fact that you say an unlikely ally in the Norwegian government, but the Norwegian government, I think, has always had solidarity very much at its heart, also at the global level. But the reason that they have put the Oslo Medicines Initiative high on the agenda is that they are concerned also about their domestic market today and in the future, when we are likely to continue to see more innovation becoming available. But within the spirit of universal health coverage, which is the model pursued by Norway and a number of other countries, and which is the model that we as WHO endorse and underwrite, and we will be celebrating Universal Health Coverage Day on Sunday, it's not enough for a few patients to have access because they have a preferential insurance scheme. It's not enough for a few patients to have access because they are part of the high income countries. It's not acceptable for there to be a two, five or 10 year delay in innovation reaching um, patients across our region. So the Oslo Medicines Initiative is a very broad and ambitious initiative. And I'm glad also that we are receiving even the support from our colleagues in the EU. Um, Sylvain has uh, joined our scientific program committee to prepare for a high level meeting in June. And also our colleagues in OECD have reached out to us and would like to support this initiative. I think this sends a very strong and encouraging message. Last <coughs> year, we did a preliminary round of consultations. And it is very clear, listening to the various stakeholders, <coughs> the points of view are very, very different. It's also very clear that we need to speak to the industry. As I'm sure Sylvan and Clemens will tell you, we wouldn't, they would not have been able to pull off this joint procurement initiative if there was not this rapport, this dialogue, this platform of engagement with the industry. And through the Oslo Medicines Initiative, which is premised on the principles of solidarity, transparency, and sustainability, in the next six months, it will be a sprint now, Yanis. It will be a sprint as we prepare a series of webinars where we will uh, disseminate the findings from a number of background papers that have studied the issue um, uh, in various, uh, uh, from various aspects. It will be a sprint to see whether we can obtain consensus on the problem statement and the number of actions to take it forward. And of course, pooled procurement is one of the actions that we could consider, but alone it is not enough. Can we do better even in terms of the COVID vaccine procurement? Possibly yes. Possibly there is a need to consider options such as equity-based tier pricing too. And one could argue that a flat price across a continent with still very, very stark economic disparities does not do everybody justice in the best way. I hand back to you, Yanis. Thank you, Natasha. And just for me to understand, uh, let's say that we fast forward to June 2022 and we're in Oslo at the meeting. What would be, what is your best case scenario? What would you like to get out of it? Um, a statement? Um, what exactly? I would like very much that we can have a statement where there is a joint and common recognition that there is a problem, where there is an agreed narrative on what the problem is. And this might seem like a small step, but even there, we are still arguing on the language that needs to be used around the problem statement in itself. 
and then around an ambition to create a joint platform to really work on finding the innovative solutions. We know that these will not be found overnight, but if we at least can agree that the system is not working, it's not working for anyone, it needs to change, and we can identify two or three areas which we work on then going from the political to the technical. So in June, primarily, it's about um, our desire to achieve a political consensus, not only between member states, but with partners also about the problem and about the fact that the current uh, model is not working and the agreement to work together to do something about it going forward. We will then be on June need to come again back to really working on the technical solutions that would have been discussed and which seem to be the most promising. Thank you, Natasha. That's very clear. Clemens, um, let's give it a bit of thought. I mean, looking at the, the experience with the vaccines procurement, and of course, vaccines are vaccines, therapeutics is a, medicines is a kind of a different deal. But what would you, um, what are the lessons that you are drawing that you would like to see reflected in terms of policy recommendations and initiatives and actions, some food for thought perhaps even for the Oslo Medicines Initiative, as to the next steps uh, beyond the pandemic. You mentioned already that um, this is a success story that you would like to build on. In, in what respect, in which direction, what would you like to see? If you can unmute yourself so we can hear you. Sorry. Um, I want to be also a second, a, a, a moment very critical. Joint procurement on the European level, as we have witnessed in many, many instances, is not a very interesting and successful tool or instrument. The exception was the COVID vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine procurement. That was different. And why is that? You know, why haven't been this joint procurement initiatives not more successful on the European level? Because we have, we still have a very fragmented market. Because we, you know, who is the buyer? Who is the buyer of innovative drugs? In most instances, these are clinics or associations of clinics, et cetera, et cetera. In the fewest moments, it's governments. You know, Yes, there are also governments who procure that, but in many times, these are clinics. So we have a very, very fragmented market. So we have to, we have to think about that and, and, and consolidate the purchases market, number one. Number two is we have to, and you know the commission and it's not the commission it's not you sylvain it's not dg sante but your agencies are not doing a good job when it comes to joint procurement so we have you know we have to leave them out so we have to start all over again and i think the covid 19 vaccine procurement is a best practice example why because there was a pot of money there was a budget you know there was easy funding we had we all together, you know, with, with the contributions by the Commission and the member states, we had almost 2.7 billion euros, you know, to, to get that started for the down payments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we do need a pot of money. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You know, so this is my second recommendation, you know, have a, a strong financing instrument, you know, be clear what to do with it. You know, I'm talking about innovative drugs. I'm not talking about generics or whatever. I'm talking very specialized, innovative drugs. Uh, and then you need a body, a negotiating body, who is negotiating uh, the, 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 the conditions, the APAs or whatever is necessary, the prices. And, you know, the third element is, of course, this exercising the market power of 450 million people. You know, this was the strongest point we had with the COVID-19 vaccine, you know. I, you know, I was, as many of you know, I was co-chairing this the, until March, this, this, whole, this whole process of, of this joint COVID-19 vaccine. I remember seeing numbers 
by industry association telling us the prices they expect from high income country when it came to this uh, innovative COVID-19 vaccines. These prices were absurdly high, out of touch. But collectively, as the market of the European Union, the market of 25, uh, we brought the prices down. So this is also a good example of exercising market power when it comes to cost and prices. And you know, the industry loves to play ball with us in a fragmented market, you know, because why do they come to Austria first and to Germany and to the Netherlands? Because we are willing to pay a high price, you know? Absolutely. But jointly together, we are not willing to these, pay these high prices anymore. So these are three, four points I would like to make, which we have to consider. Very clear. Silva, so <clears throat> money, leverage, so that you also have the, for the, 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 and the predictability also, so that you have these parameters in place, so that also the industry is willing to, to play ball. How encouraged are you by your own efforts uh, to try to organize and to coordinate and to exchange with the payers or the buyers, if we want to call it like that? And is that a priority within, uh, within your, the commission and within your work? You mentioned it already in your opening remarks. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, what uh, Clement said is very, very important. And if I can summarize under his control, and uh, I would say we need to take the lessons of uh, what we've done together in the context of COVID-19. But we also need to understand that it was a very specific situation with very specific su success factors and that maybe it is not always replicable for everything in a sort of standardized or systematic way. This is what I understand he said. I don't know if you would agree with this summary, but I think this is how we would approach it indeed. And I think it is important that we see um, whether there is a possibility to, so now if we move out of the war time, if I may say, in a sort of peacetime situation for certain specific products. And he mentioned some examples and they've been mentioned and they are mentioned in your paper as well. Uh, can we develop uh, such an approach? And then the next questions are, yes, of course, certainly. Uh, we need to look about, you know, what are the budget we're ready to put into that? Is it a joint budget? Is it a common budget? Is, uh, that is a question. Uh, we also need to look at the legal context because there are some questions about that. You know that we've had a legal, a legal framework for that type of instrument. It, and it's still there. For the moment, it does not be expanded to uh, product that are not specifically related to uh, countermeasures in, in, in the case of pandemic. So we would also need to see, I mean, if member states want to do something, it's certainly possible within even the uh, current legislation on public procurement to do joint procurement. So uh, in a way, I'm not the lawyer, and so I should be careful what I'm saying, but I think there would be a, pos a possible legal context if, if that was what we want to and what I wanted the, the, the other thing I wanted to say is that you know in his in, intervention our colleague from uh, uh, you know, the, the, the chair of, of your working group on, on uh, access to medicines he highlighted that it, there's a panoply of situation uh, categories of actions I don't know how he said that and he talked about and John procurement he said is like the most developed one of the cooperation. But there are many other steps that can be taken also uh, before going to the fully fledged uh, joint procurement. Uh, it talked about common negotiations. It talked about uh, sharing of information to start with. So I think it's also important to look at this from that perspective that uh, your paper sets. Now, when it comes to what we want to do, I mean, we've said in, uh, in the strategy that the procurement tool generally, whether it's joint procurement, whether it's uh, uh, sharing information or whether it's purely national, it's all local, because as Clemens explained, you know, it's not always that it's vote centrally for one country. So whatever the format it takes, you know, there are ways to use this tool in a way that uh, it can bring affordability or it can ensure availability or that if we have to pay a certain number of 
for a certain number of things. We, the authorities understand why they're paying more. I mean, are they paying more because they want to secure supplies? Are they a certain type of, of product? Are they paying more for a, a, a quality that would be improved? I don't know. So this kind of thing. So it's important to use the tool, the procurement tool also as a tool for policy making. And this is what we want to propose uh, in the group. Uh, if the member states want to discuss how to extend the scheme or how to discuss how what, uh, I mean, we're very open to that. And we've told them, you know, this is your agenda, their agenda, we're working with presidencies. So this issue uh, can come on the agenda. Uh, we are also doing ourselves a study now that we've launched and we'll have the result in a few months, sort of mapping this, the procurement tool, trying to understand indeed um, how it can be useful for what I said. And on that basis, we will also generate discussions, including uh, possibly on reinforcing the, the public procurement. Last thing I say is that we also need to learn from the experience of the um, uh, voluntary collaborations that have uh, started to develop in the last few years, including Beneluxa, but the other ones, and, and some of the, the challenges that they have, they have encountered while trying to develop a policy also around um, or a cooperation around procurement. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of uh, lots of ideas there, Natasha. The uh, it, it's good and thank you because you brought um, you reminded us of the broader uh, Europe dimension beyond the the, the EU. Um, in your opinion, because you are monitoring the situation across the WHO Europe region, how has the pandemic changed, or how has it how is the pandemic shaping the dynamic and the market landscape also? Um, between governments and pharmaceutical companies, and also um, within the Oslo Medicines Initiative, are you encouraged by the industry's uh, stance? Do you see progressive? Um, do you hear progressive voices there? Thank you, Yanis. So perhaps uh, the first thing I would like to mention um, around the voluntary uh, collaborations. Already last year, um, we had published a policy brief, which actually sought to evaluate um, what worked, what didn't work so well in these voluntary collaborations, and also includes a checklist of top tips. I will share that in the, in the chat. When it comes to the broader picture, I mean, one of the things that, that we always need to really bear in mind and emphasize is that uh, countries have very different capacities too. So as Sylvain was, was saying, I mean, joint procurement is, is one model. But actually, we need to understand also that countries have different capacities because of size, because of history. So even initiatives, for example, to support uh, as the EU was taking forward joint health technology assessment or to support um, uh, the work on even on pricing strategies and really building that capacity at country level is extremely important. What we have seen during the pandemic, for example, is a heightened appetite which we often um, sometimes don't see because it's complex and people don't understand it, in investment in the regulatory aspects around quality, safety, efficacy. Because of the vaccine itself, there has been a renewed interest in a number of non-EU countries that are not therefore um, obliged to follow the, the very stringent EU acquis in the medicines regulatory field, stepping forward and saying, hey, we want to invest, we want to improve our capacity because we understand that in order to improve access to medicines, to vaccines, it's the strengthening of the whole ecosystem. This is what the countries are coming and asking us for. And we are actually overwhelmed by the interest that we are seeing, something that perhaps didn't exist to this extent, the recognition of having the importance of having robust, and, and resilient procurement and supply chains, the, the ability to have that core capacity at the country level to be able to negotiate with industry, to be able to talk to industry. And you asked me about industry. I would like to say that uh, earlier this year, um, the regional director, Hans Kluwe and myself were actually invited to address uh, the biopharmaceutical CEO round table um, through the invitation to FPA, where we pitched the Oslo Medicines Initiative. And we have made clear our commitment that industry is got to be part of the discussion. Of course, maybe you have to ask me the question again, 
after the Oslo meeting in June. But so far, let me say that I'm cautiously optimistic that there is a recognition that something needs to be done differently. Of course, the devil is in the detail. So I think we need to get back to that in summer. But I can't not enter this process with determination and the sense of optimism. And I think this is the way we should all enter it together. Thank you, Natasha. Final question to you, Clemens. You have one minute because we're already wrapping up. Have you, uh, you've been working, you've been negotiating with uh, the industries over the past uh, two years, practically more or less during the pandemic, but also before the pandemic on the national level. Um, are you encouraged by, do you see any change in their behavior? Do you hear, do you see any progressive voices? One minute, please. I do see a younger generation in pharmaceutical management who has started having a different approach to that. Uh, it's not black and white when you talk about industry. You know, some companies also in the vaccine, nine, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine uh, issue were impeccably uh, uh, strong when it came to pricing. You know, I, I mean, AstraZeneca had lots of problems with, uh, with production, but when it comes to setting a price, it was impeccable. Also Johnson & Johnson, by the way, to name companies now, but they have to be named because they, they, they did a good thing did a really good job. So I see some changes, you know, but, uh, but friends, once again, you know, we are talking about here cancer, cancer drugs, and we have the focus on innovation. Please, please don't forget that the, I think even the larger problem within the European Union, we will have with, uh, with, with, uh, with secure supply of generic drugs. And that's, that's, a, that's an issue which has nothing to do with high prices. It is, it has, it is, it's more a problem of low prices and, <clears throat> and with, with securing the supply chain. So please don't forget that topic because it, it's it, at least as important as innovation. And also what Natasha reminded us also of the reality, the realities on the ground and the very real life implications and limitations for public administration. I want to thank you um, all. It was a, a rich, short, quick discussion with lots of uh, food for thought. We're now going to proceed um, with our uh, second panel. Silvain Giraud, Natasa Zopardi Muska, Clement Sauer, thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining us. You're more than welcome to stay. We will continue our discussion. Now we will hear from Dimitri Koller from the Swiss Cancer League and the um, ECL Access to Medicines Task Force with a snapshot of the recommendations that ECL is putting forward. I remind you, we're launching the ECL paper on cross-border uh, initiatives of collaboration. Uh, you can find it already online. Dimitri, over to you um, to give us indeed a snapshot of these um, recommendations and we proceed with a, a few more very important national perspectives on the topic. Dimitri. Thank you, Yanis. Um, yes, so as uh, Yanis said, it is a snapshot. So uh, my first recommendation would be to go through the, the paper to see all the, the recommendations. Um, we made them at different levels. So um, the first uh, level uh, is uh, among the uh, EU policymaker and WHO Europe advisor. Um, and we recommend to build on the COVID-19 procurement experience. Uh, to centrally purchase effective novel cancer treatments and also to include a robust, robust HTA as part of the process. Uh, also to organize and facilitate roundtable jointly coordinated by the WHO Europe and the European Commission to encourage this co cooperation and the uh, on-farm uh, information sharing, uh, especially regarding the price setting procedures. In addition, uh, we recommend to develop digital platforms to provide national and regional uh, authorities with guidance and uh, expertise uh, in this field of uh, joint procurement and to support and advance coordinated development of uh, medicine by academia, nonprofit research or organization and uh, non-commercial entities. Next slide, please. Uh, at the national and the regional uh, level, um, we uh, encourage to uh, identify and start with the quick wins uh, to build trust because it's one of uh, the um, uh, crucial uh, points in this kind of collaboration. 
and then to extend uh, pragmatically the collaboration. Uh, also to uh, build relationship with members that are facing uh, the same challenge regarding access to, uh, to medicines and also encourage uh, the use of database such as the uh, European Integra Integrated Price Information Database, so the EURIPID. And to the civil society um, uh, organization, uh, we recommend them to team up with uh, like-minded organizations at the national and the regional uh, level uh, to call on the national and EU policymaker uh, to build on the experience and the lesson learned from past procurement agreements. Uh, and we have also example uh, in our paper of these uh, successful uh, um, procurement and uh, initiative. And also to develop in-house skills to run uh, communication and advocacy campaigns uh, during uh, windows of opportunity. So maybe one uh, very important message for us for a good start would be uh, to keep it simple, uh, to start with uh, low hanging fruits uh, that would uh, allow uh, the uh, different countries to build trust uh, and then to go step by step pragmatically uh, in a more extended uh, collaboration. So thank, thank you very you. much, Dimitri. Thank you. And I, I must I, I want to say that I'm, I'm very proud of uh, ECL. I've seen the organization grow over the years with their own fully fledged access to medicines advocacy with a with a loud voice and then an effective uh, voice working closely uh, with national policymakers. Uh, so combining um, EU level Brussels level advocacy with uh, action on the ground. So congratulations to ECL um, for all your hard work over the past uh, years. Let's move on to the, um, the the second panel that we have today. It is a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sabine Vogler from Austria, from the Austrian National Public Health Institute, GÖK. Uh, we all know GÖK in, in Europe. Momir Radulovic. Momir, um, especially for him, it's a very busy week with the conclusion uh, practically of or almost running to the very end of the Slovenian presidency of the um, EU. Um, and uh, uh, the Slovenians um, uh, coordinated the effort to sign off also council conclusions um, uh, with elements on pharmaceuticals as well. Thank you, Momir, for uh, joining us. And of course, with Breu Van Dam from the Belgian uh, national payer from uh, the, we all know it, all of us living in um, uh, Belgium, uh, Rizzi Vinami. Uh, good to see you, Breuk. Let me see you on my on my screen. There you are as well. So the uh, we heard already from uh, Clemens, uh, Sylvain and um, Natasha. We already he heard uh, their perspectives, but I want to I want to go to um, Breuk and ask you. I was uh, surprised recently. I read that this uh, statement that came out, and we already, you know, Beneluxa has become a household name. There was a, a joint statement. I took it as a common sense reminder. You were reminding us the message that you were sending to the world was that before we start reimbursing products and, and medicines, we should actually assess them. Uh, what um, motivated you to put this statement out, um, and what is your reading? In the your reading of the situation um, uh, in light of the pandemic, when it comes to uh, the pricing and reimbursement issue. Hello, Yanis. Hello, all, and thank you for uh, having me. It's an honor uh, to, to to be here. Um, good question. Um, so, of course, um, you know the situation is 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 more um, difficult than we, we we hoped we would be a couple of months ago. And I feel like policymakers want to use the complete uh, arsenal of, of 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 methods and instruments they have at their disposal to fight this uh, terrible pandemic. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, could be. Uh, the therapeutics that are coming out, uh, several of which uh, are in the process of receiving their marketing authorization. And the idea is whether we can uh, and should wait and 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 um, follow the, the usual procedures to do the HTA and, 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 and consider reimbursement, or if uh, you know the costs of, of waiting uh, would be uh, would be uh, would outweigh the benefit of, of potentially moving forward uh, quicker, um, and I think the 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 the, the five ministers, uh, so the, the the Dutch, the Belgian, Austrian, Irish, and and Belgian minister have indeed um, you know set out a statement saying no no we want to uh, do this assessment 
uh, albeit maybe in a, um, in a joint uh, way, uh, also pooling resources between countries so we can move forward more quickly and, and pool the, the, the best expertise we have at our disposal uh, to uh, consider a reimbursement. Um, and, and I think that is trying to make the synthesis of, on the one hand, wanting to move fast because we know this could be one of the necessary pieces in the, um, in the solution we want to bring as fast as possible to patients and, and the population alike. And on the other hand, of course, uh, making sure that we are paying for something that is effective, that is, of course, safe, that will have been established beforehand, but effective and, and worth uh, the investment of, of public uh, money. Yes, because I'm, I'm a bit concerned, you know, I see uh, because of the dynamic which is um, created uh, for obvious and understandable reasons in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, I see that there is a bit of a return to kind of access to anything and everything. Um, uh, and there is a push for that kind of uh, school of thought. And I guess the, when I read um, your statement, first of all, I was happy to see that Benelux is still alive. <laughs> and secondly, <laughs> um, secondly, to see that, uh, yes, we need to a bit, I am understanding obviously the emergency, but we need to take a step back and reflect um, before we just grant uh, access to anything and everything. Yeah, absolutely. That's 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 the that's a trade-off that has to be made, and I, I think we with the five countries we found uh, you know a, sort of a middle ground where we try to reconcile the best of uh, you know classic HTA procedures with the need of uh, you know having all the instruments at our disposal to fight this uh, this this pandemic. And indeed, um, some could uh, see this as an opportunity to uh, you know move beyond uh, the procedures and potentially you know um, put a burden of proof. Uh, where it shouldn't be, uh, or maybe even, you know, get rid of the burden of proof altogether, and that would be a very uh, pernicious uh, evolution. I, I completely agree. Momir, um, speaking of what Brev just mentioned, the burden of proof and the moving a bit, perhaps uh, the burden of proof to, uh, I don't know. I see in the regulatory sphere, and of course you are the head of the Slovenian Medicines Agency and, and a fellow board member at the EMA. I see there is a, a pressure perhaps from the industry size to have more of this kind of rolling review becoming the, the new kind of norm or the new rule um, or the multiplication proliferation rather of, of, uh, adapt, of, of pathways of approval pathways. What is what is your feeling when it comes to this regulatory dimension. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, for inviting me to be part of this important discussion so regarding the. A rolling review. Definitely, this is uh, this is the output output of the strong regulatory system, and uh, we have uh, vaccines and now therapeutics in market uh, in less time than it was previously expected. So now we receive each 14 days a uh, new data package, and we assess it from the uh, from um, again from the uh, uh, different angle, you know, because it's a different data. And before it was 210 days with the clock stops. Uh, of course, regulatory efficiency is a prerequisite for modern pharmaceutical system. And I think we need to bring EU regulatory approval times onto par with those in the other part of the world. But of course, this is not easily done because we, of course, ideally we would all like to, uh, we would all like to optimize our resources. But it's the same as is uh, in the production triangle. This H tool used to, to present and maintain realistic expectations. So we have time, we have quality, and we have money or resources. You know, so we just need to pick two out of this. You know, because we have a limited number of uh, uh, experts in the European regulatory network, and uh, this rolling review cannot be done uh, uh, continuously. And if I may just uh, comment on the previous uh, intervention, so we would like to see premium value with premium evidence. So this is uh, this is what we really want to see as a regulators. You know, not to uh, not to uh, all the time assess the data, and at the end we we see that it's not effective. And we have COVID nineteen examples like with hydroxychloroquine. We have this uh, then uh, data with severe, which it didn't live up to expectations now the same is happening with monopiravir you know so this is still uh, that we really need to have to assess the full data package in a robust way 
Yes, and, and uh, it's it's important that you mention it. And I guess this also falls under the more the broader heading of, of transparency also in pharma and having more data, better data, more evidence. Um, and especially on that, Sabine, you from your academic um, perspective, um, you have looked over the years um, into uh, a very sensitive topic. And, and here we have also with us a Breuk. Uh, he, uh, he represents one of the most influential payers in Europe. The question of net prices transparency uh, and whether that could be, would be or is conducive to fair um, medicine deals, which is also the, the topic of our event today. What are your thoughts on that? It's, it is an issue which is quite high also on the agenda here in Brussels with the pharmaceutical strategy. Um, is it, does it work? or is it worth experimenting with or is it dangerous? Thank you very much. Thank you, Yanis, for inviting me. And uh, yes, uh, speaking here from my point of view as a researcher, it's always difficult uh, to get the question where we cannot really give a very clear answer because one of the problems is with transparency, um, there is not much evidence out. There were several some reviews and, and some are ongoing looking into studies to see what was the impact of for instance net price transparency and there is not much there why because we are living in a system where it's most common to have this uh, managed entry agreements with uh, the secret deals and uh, I'm also aware of, of studies that should have been done and needed to be stopped. So that's the evidence, but we have uh, not that strong anecdotal evidence as well. And what we see, to see it from the other point of view, we have now the situation of intransparent. And there's often this argument, well, the current system ha would help because with the trans intransparent uh, discounts, also countries in, let's say, Eastern Europe with lower income would get access to medicines. But when we look there, we don't see the countries do not have access to the medicines. And uh, looking then at the prices, I acknowledge mainly at the list prices, they sometimes really pay high prices. And I'm aware of one study where also the, the, the discount list prices were looked at. And interestingly, countries with lower income sometimes even paid more in countries uh, which had a large market uh, more able to uh, secure the discount, to secure uh, the medicines. So this is one thing. The other thing, and that's maybe not so easily to put into figures, is it has to do what we heard also before about an even level field so that there needs to be better balance in the pharmaceutical sector. And then with the prices, there's one thing I would really like to focus on and, and put the attention. Well, the payers get lower prices, but it's a business. So this needs to be factored in. So in fact, uh, the list prices will be higher. And uh, we did one study where we looked at it and empirically we could find some evidence for that. So to conclude, while we do not know too much, we see that the current system does not help to improve access on the country. And uh, I'll stop now here. What would also be important when we discuss about transparency, not only look at the net prices. I know there's a lot of discussion on transparency of R&D costs, but also think about processes and, and frame it more generally uh, looking at yeah, the balance in the pharma sector, but also about uh, accountability and fairness and solidarity as well. Thank you. Thank you. Preu, coming to you, confidentiality works or not? You with Reziv, you've been signing for more than I think 10 years by now. You have solid experience in managed entry agreements. This, this um, great taxonomy of managed entry agreements. Where are we today? Um, is it still working and all of these deals? Give us your, we heard the academic perspective, if I can put it this way. Give us your uh, reality from the ground, a reality check on the ground. 
Please unmute yourself. Sorry. Um, it's a good question. Um, it's true that I think we started with these managed entry agreements since 2011 in, in Belgium, uh, being, I think, one of the first to, to do so. And at first, it was really, I think, useful tool to, you know, especially with the breakthrough medicines we had then to manage uh, risks, right? Uh, manage risk between the producers on the one hand and the payers uh, on, the, uh, on the other hand. Um, now we see that indeed, uh, and you see this in the numbers, I think we went from a couple of uh, tens of millions of euros worth of you know, uh, medicines, uh, drugs that were under contract to more than half of our uh, medicines budget. Uh, to give you an idea, the net expenditures for medicines in Belgium is about 5 billion uh, euros. Uh, the gross expenditures is over 6 billion euros. So we receive back more than 1 billion euros, uh, which corresponds to uh, average 40% uh, uh, back uh, of the uh, initial uh, list price or, or estimated budget impact. Um, and one of the reasons is that um, indeed this tool is being used uh, not only to you know, manage clinical risks, but in some cases only to uh, negotiate a lower price because there are no clinical uncertainties to, uh, you know, to, to, to take into account. Uh, so I think that is, that is a perverse effect. Second uh, element is we see the same um, evolution that uh, Sabina Vogler was referring to, um, being that the average discount has increased, uh, I looked at the numbers yesterday, from an average of 15% in 2015 to, as I said, more than 40% today. So obviously, I you know, have a high trust in my negotiators and experts, uh, and they undoubtedly become better negotiators. Uh, but I also think, uh, and that is probably the most uh, likely explanation, that, uh, of course, uh, these expectations are factored in the list price, which we then take into account to demand uh, bigger rebates. Uh, and that's how a, uh, you know, uh, um, a dynamic is being created, I think, that is uh, potentially not improving access, but uh, could indeed uh, hamper it. So I think it's uh, now, you know, coming to the solutions, if I, if I have a, one more minute, Yanis, um, I think we need indeed to, 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 to push this agenda for transparency, but at the European level, I know policymakers like to, you know, uh, say that it's with at European level because on national level, it's too difficult, but I think in this case, uh, for a country uh, on itself to do so, it could be uh, very costly uh, for patients, but also for uh, taxpayers uh, alike. Second, I think we need to redefine the scope of when to use MEAs. There is indeed a taxonomy. Let's try to respect that. Uh, and thirdly, uh, I think we need uh, some more, um, you know, bold initiatives, maybe at the EU level, where uh, some of the evidence that the EMA asks to gather should somehow uh, you know, uh, if it doesn't happen, uh, the, the, the distributor um, should be uh, held accountable, and that will also allow us to have a way better uh, evaluation of those conventions, uh, of those MEAs, and if they are not uh, corresponding, you know, if they're not reaching the, 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 the the benchmarks that we set, uh, well, then, 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 then lesser reimbursement or, or de-reimbursement uh, should be an option. I think that would be way stronger if EMA uh, gave us some, some tools to do so. Thank you. That's, these are very clear recommendations. And if I hear you and if I understand you correctly, transparency doesn't scare you necessarily, as long as, as it's, it's done correctly. Or it's, it's... And the second point that I want to clarify there is already somewhat transparency. You no, know? for instance, within Benelupsa, you have the capacity to exchange some information more than in the past. In any case, correct. So I think I think transparency should be as much as possible uh, be realized on the European level, or at least have a critical mass of countries to decide together to do so. Otherwise, we're gonna, especially as a small country, shoot ourselves in the foot, and that would not benefit Belgian patients uh, at all. Uh, second, I think by redefining and being more strict on when to apply an MEA would indeed exclude a whole bunch of uh, products, uh, which de facto with the list price would indeed, uh, you know, uh, reach a transparency that we that we seek. Momir, how does this sound to you? And what is the experience that you're having in, in Slovenia so far? Transparency or no transparency? Confidentiality is better or not? Secret deals? Well, I'm in strong favor for transparency, but it's not easy, uh, easily achieved. And I'm sure that this is a long run. 
and we need to put solutions in place to make it possible. And uh, if I can go to the managed entry agreements, they provide earlier accessibility of medicines through the publicly funded healthcare systems. And uh, this is done even if added therapeutics value has not yet been proven. On the other side, we don't have any methodology guidelines for managed entry agreements, and this could be done on EU level. I think uh, if I can be provocative, these managed entry agreements are more like a supermarket strategy. You know, you buy two, you get the third one for free. So I don't think we should treat medicines as a commodity, but more as a necessity. And I think we should incorporate real world evidence inside so that uh, 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 the pricing authorities would have uh, available uh, data so the decisions can be uh, made based on the evidence. And uh, uh, of course, excluding the medicines from reimbursement might still be a very difficult uh, question for a public payer because of course, patient expectations are high and they have been created already and pressure from the media and from public uh, might be exercised. But on the other side, I think to manage a decision, a possible discontinuation also after the application of managed entry agreements should be in place. And I think we should also think about this is an investment strategy if, uh, if there is no added value of the medicines. And ECL also produces the reports about those uh, medicines uh, uh, in oncology, they didn't provide such a big uh, clinically meaningful outcome. And we should also uh, talk about that as well. Sabine, you mentioned before, um, and also ECL in the, in the paper that we're launching today, um, they're mentioning some low hanging fruits. And you mentioned that transparency of net prices, obviously, it's something worth exploring, but there are other steps that we can take before that. There are some, you, we can look at process. Could you please elaborate on that? Could you give us some other ideas where transparency could be perhaps more uh, easily applicable or even desirable? Yeah, the question is, thank you, what you, how broad you define it. And I think, yes, net price transparency is not a low hanging fruit, but if you maybe do not use the word transparency, but uh, a general awareness. So the discussion that we have now here on managed entry agreements, we would have had this discussion 10 years ago in a totally different way. Countries would argue that they need the managed entry agreements. Now everybody sees the limitations. So uh, this uh, maybe educational aspect or capacity building aspect is something where we have better informant. And the other thing is um, low hanging fruit also taking in, in, in connection as it was done in the paper with regard to cross country collaborations. I think it's this understanding how the different legal processes are in different countries. Uh, it has also to do with motivation with uh, different countries see that they work together, that the same issues are in different countries. And uh, uh, what I would say a low hanging fruit or maybe not a low hanging fruit, but more pragmatic one is that um, countries have certain expertise and they can bring it in in a collaborative way. I'm thinking, and procurement was already mentioned before, um, procurement is can be optimized. For instance, we have now the discussion on having more environmental mar environmental criteria in procurement. And if we think about what the Nordics do, they procure together and their strong experience goes into it. And another point, which I think uh, shouldn't be underestimated, you mentioned at the very beginning when you talked to Pro, uh, the statement that Beneluxa did on HDA, I think that cross-country collaborations could take the role or to be those to speak up to certain issues, to certain topics, saying, be aware uh, that they get a voice in the, yeah, kind of get a voice in Europe and to make other countries think. So this is a... Sabine, we lost you. Yeah, if you can... Uh, we just lost the very last seconds. If you would like to repeat what you said. 
You need to unmute yourself. There you go. No, unfortunately, me, I cannot hear you. I don't know if others can. No, we cannot hear can you. Can you some, hear me some. now? Now you're back. Wonderful. Yes. So can... it is a, this is a Zoom problem that it's... Zoom somehow... does its own thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I can't control it. No, I think the last sentence was just uh, I was first talking about being a little bit uh, the, the, the topic setter, which can be done. And this is, from my understanding, a very broad understanding of... Uh, transparency, but these are also issues. And maybe to, to add one final thing, what countries could also like Benelaxida think about what do we have uh, as a maybe a common willingness to pay. So uh, being in a very uh, proactive uh, role steering it. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. And, and that allows me to take my question to Breuk. Where Where do we stand with Benelaxida? Um, should we be optimistic that it's still around or is it dying? Please unmute yourself. Yes, 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 I am unmuted. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you for your question. No, we've. I don't think we've ever been more enthusiastic, uh, aren't we, uh, Sabina, with Beneluxa than today? We uh, closed, uh, I think, a deal with three negotiating countries on Zolgensma uh, in September, I think, at the end of September, uh, beginning of October. Uh, so Ireland, the Netherlands and Belgium negotiated together. Uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the International Horizon Scanning Initiative is uh, moving forward and is uh, going to be fully operational uh, very soon. Uh, you saw the statement, we want to do something together around COVID uh, therapeutics. Um, and then there's also on the operational level, quite a bit of uh, things uh, that are moving. So, uh, you know, to, to, to build this uh, further because we see uh, more than ever, there is momentum because of the, you know, COVID vaccines and the lessons that can be drawn from them. Uh, and some of the, you know, uh, issues that we're all facing, uh, prices of 2 million euros, uh, one-off therapies, uh, the need to share expertise, the complexity of, uh, of the whole uh, you know, policy framework. Uh, we need to learn from each other, um, uh, both on a clinical level, but also on a, poli on a policy level. Um, and I, I don't think we've ever, uh, you know, had so many uh, meetings and exchanges as we did in the last couple of months. Uh, only Monday, the five ministers uh, met before the EBSCO uh, meeting of Tuesday. Uh, so we're, uh, we're very much alive. Lovely. And Momir, speaking of EBSCO and speaking of the council conclusions um, of, under your presidency, um, what did you try to achieve with these council conclusions? And if you can highlight, just to wrap up, two, three elements that, in your opinion, are important also for future presidencies to pick up and continue. Uh, well, Slovenia uh, tackled two issues from the pharma strategy, and uh, I would encourage all future presidencies, so the next three-year presidency also to uh, tackle at least two, uh, two things that are stated in pharma uh, strategy. And we, if we do find the solutions for uh, these uh, uh, tactics mentioned pharma strategy, I think we can achieve a lot. So Slovenia uh, uh, put focus on the local medicines where there is no commercial interest, So, but their uh, importance to patients and for public health is clear. And uh, these, these were antibiotics and uh, in the case of repurposed medicines, and clearly both is very relevant also for the cancer patients. And uh, we have these shortages of medicines. This includes commercially uh, not interesting medicines uh, and uh, especially generic one of the pattern. And uh, we, put, we, we uh, put quite a lot of effort to uh, also make a council uh, conclusions as firm as possible. But I would just like to uh, mention two points from the council conclusions actually to develop specific joint EU research capacities that would also facilitate research findings in the development of antimicrobials and offer support in translating research findings into development of antimicrobials in clinical practice. But we would also like to see union-wide clinical trials network and data sharing platforms, you know, because majority of the trial is now mononational. And if they are multinational, they're done in two to five countries. That's why I think we need to go beyond that in the strong European Health Union. And the second big thing I would say is actually that we put that EU should explore um, uh, a possibility of publicly financed or non-for-profit manufacturing facilities 
in case of lack of commercial interest. We think that we have a momentum now uh, when the EU is devoting a lot of uh, attention to strong European health union. And I think it now is also the opportunity to explore these kind of solutions to see if they are feasible at all and what would be the benefits um, and what would be the market implications. Thank you. Thank you, Momir. And as, as Sabine said, who would have thought only a few years back that we would be having uh, such a reference um, to non-profit production or uh, let's say the public pharma option um, in council conclusions of the EU? Of course, we know that council conclusions do not mean much or they can also have zero impact, but um, it is also up to the Commission now, since it is in the text, to see what the initiatives will be uh, from now onwards. I, I want to thank you all. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Dr. Sabine Vogler from uh, Vienna, Brug van Damme from Brussels, and uh, Momir Radulovic from Ljubljana. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to wish you happy holidays. And this is um, uh, just uh, uh, one of the um, uh, stops in a very long journey. I'm sure we will have this uh, conversation again, but I think it was already quite rich and quite uh, operational, let's say. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for joining us. You're more than welcome to stay. We're also coming to the uh, uh, slowly to the end of our um, event. We will now hear from um, one of the most influential, I would say, MEPs in the European Parliament, um, Mr. Tomislav uh, Sokol. He sent us um, a pre-recorded uh, message. Uh, he plays a role, obviously, um, in the um, uh, BECA committee, the Special Committee Against Cancer, and uh, as um, I mentioned at the very beginning, this is an event also supported by the MEPs Against Cancer Interest Group in the European Parliament, uh, whose um, uh, MEP Tomislav Sokov is a member. So let's let's listen to what he has to say. Dear event participants, dear expert speakers, dear colleagues. As a member of the MEPS Against Cancer Interest Group and the BECA Committee at the European Parliament, I'm delighted to close this important webinar on cross-border collaboration initiatives and joint procurement for medicines. I could not attend in person because of other commitments, but I'm glad to deliver a closing address. I want to thank the Association of European Cancer Leagues, the European Public Health Alliance and the European Fair Pricing Network for having organized this timely event. For the past few months, the European Parliament Special Committee on Beating Cancer has been working on a major initiative, a report on the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, building on the work initiated by the European Commission in February. This report will address the disease pathway with a comprehensive approach, from prevention to quality of life of cancer patients and survivors, and will be voted in plenary in January 2022. Together with my colleagues of the European Parliament, we have provided a rapporteur of the fast suggested amendments. In this regard, Fostering cross-border collaboration in the field of healthcare is surely an important aspect close to my heart. A European health union that delivers to its patients and to its citizens as a whole is a European health union where there are no borders that hamper access to medicines. The European Parliament and the European Commission can help member states pave the way towards fair prices so that all citizens can access the medicines they need. Joint negotiations and procurement can strengthen bargaining power and lower prices to ultimately protect the sustainability of healthcare systems. With the revision of the pharmaceutical legislation and Europe's beating cancer plan, patients' lives are in the hands of policymakers. All EU cancer patients should benefit from the most advanced health technologies regardless of where they live in the EU. Initiatives such as Beneluxa demonstrate that new expensive medicines can find their way in Europe. There is not a single pharmaceutical market, but nowadays challenges cannot be overcome if member states work alone. Within the current legal framework, there is so much that EU can do to bring cross-border collaboration and joint procurement beyond vaccines. My message today is simple. It will only be through solidarity, cooperation and coordination that we will achieve a true European health union and bring the right medicine at the right time to the right person. Before I give the floor back to the moderator, I would like to congratulate the Association of European Cancer Leagues and its partners on your commitment and again on the organization of this meaningful event. Thank you. Indeed, and if I may say, uh, also ECL's uh, paper that we are launching today is an important contribution to this discussion, which will certainly continue. Um, it is important. We have a, a big opportunities coming our way in terms of legislation. We have the General Pharma Review, the Orphans and Pediatrics Review coming our way during 2022. And of course, it is important to have um, a proper 
uh, a thorough assessment of the experience with the EU vaccines procurement and with the ongoing contracts around vaccines and see what we did well, what could be improved. Um, but, and of course, keeping an eye on the regional initiatives, because one thing is for sure, uh, and, and that is that the issue of excessive prices will only come back to bite and that no healthcare system in Europe uh, from Cyprus all the way to Denmark, or even as we heard um, in the case of Norway with the Oslo Medicines Initiative, no country will be able to afford these prices. So these collaborations will be fueled and will be um, driven forward by the excessive prices themselves. On behalf of the organizations, on behalf of ECL, of the European Fair Pricing Network, on behalf of IFA, and of course, on behalf of the uh, MEPs Interest Group, um, um, uh, MEPs Against Cancer, we would like to thank you very much for joining us. The video will be shortly available um, on um, the YouTube channel, uh, and uh, we will make sure to uh, keep this discussion alive. Thank you very much, and have a lovely afternoon and evening. Thank you.